happy 2022, everybody. Everyone say 2022. Just feels wrong and right all at the same time. Then you realize you're just saying 2020 for a second time. Yeah, you're realizing it now. Praise God for a new year. Hey, uh, one, I want to welcome you. My name's Kyle with my wife, Care. We get to be the lead pastors here and love it. Um, so thankful. Just reiterate, uh, uh, view culture, get involved, but also next Sunday's Vision Sunday. There's certain Sundays, like I think church attendance is really important. Um, uh, some people think it's moderately important. Um, I think it's really important. Next weekend is like of the utmost importance. If you want to know where we're going, you want to know what's been, you want to know what is it, what is, you want to know the vision of you church in this next season. We've got some announcements that are going on at that time too. You want to be here, be here online, in person. Make sure that you do not miss next Sunday. Vision Sunday. One, we get to cast vision. We get to get, give you a bit of a catchphrase. Hey, oh, this is who we are. But there's all, it's really important information will be are, are shared during that time. Um, and so I want to make sure that you are there. I want to plug that. Vision Sunday, next Sunday, 10 a.m. Welcome to View Church, 10 a.m. You know, also, I also want to welcome you to, well, well, welcome to a Sunday that I didn't know I was preaching. You know, the same reason why your flight was canceled, the same reason why I'm preaching. Uh, old, old old Marion getting, you know, just doing RB music and uh, and getting me to preach on a weekend I wasn't planning on. Jose, we got a couple staff members. I don't want to name names. Jose and uh, Jose, Jose is out uh, sick. Uh, you never, it's never good when they text you. Uh, do you have time to talk? If, you, if you're in any level of leadership, uh, whether it's a home or a business, you know, do you have time to talk um, is not a good they're not like, they're not like want to catch up. Like, well, I just want to know how you've been. How's your soul? How's your walk with the Lord? It's always like, uh, you know, it's one of two things. I have COVID or I quit. It's one or the other. So um, thankfully he's only got uh, COVID and we're going to be just fine. Um, uh, and then we've got uh, Jared, Jared, the Wakefield's up here leading worship today. The stripped down band. That's a, you gotta be safe with that one. The stripped down band, um, stripped down band. And so, but they're killing, I mean, isn't that just nice? It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. If he would have played him coming back to the heart of worship, I would have probably fallen on my knees. I would have fallen on my knees in that moment. Jeez, it wasn't that good. But be praying for staff. Be praying for people. We got staff members stuck all over the country. Can't fly back. Uh, and so uh, we're just having fun. We're just having fun. How's your vacation? So I was, uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to preach. And uh, Jose's like, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm not naming names. The guy who was supposed to preach. Uh, about yay tall, uh, he's like, he's like, I'm so sorry. I said, Don't worry, I, I can, I, I can preach something. And so I feel like you're getting, uh, you're getting a word from my heart. This is like pastor's word. I, I would call it a, pro, a prophetic word from Kyle, but it's, it's, it's really just prophetic from God. Um, you know, we call ourselves prophetic, but really it's just God speaking through us. We try to take way too much credit. Um, and so I feel like this is something. This is a burden, that, and, and I feel like this is like a Vision Weekend uh, uh, half point oh. Um, like, like this is like a preview into Vision Weekend and some things that really just are burdensome on my heart. Um, and I, I want to teach a message today called "A Goal Worth Setting." I love goal people. I, I'm like pe people who are like, like, like I set a goal. I like, I'm about that life. I'm about setting audacious goals that you'll never obtain. I, I love, uh, like, I, I love the optimism of humanity, the blind faith of people, the audacity to even say, like, I'm going to do these crazy things. You know who I don't like? People who hate on people who set goals. You're annoying. Like, like I'm sorry Santa Claus didn't bring you the weenie whistle. Like, maybe next time. You understand that reference if you watch Santa Claus this break. Like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that someone else has a dream that's big and hairy and audacious. Why is it a hairy goal? I don't know. But like, like I, I love people who are like, you know what? This year I'm gonna lose 80 pounds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds. I, I'm gonna read the Bible every single day. I, I'm never gonna cuss again. You already failed. Like, like, like you know, like, like hairy, crazy, audacious. Like, I love goal people, and, and I really want to teach a message today called like a goal that's that's worth setting. A goal that's above and beyond all of the other goals in life, and, and it's a goal that God gave us. That's why it's not a prophetic word for me. It, it's all throughout Scripture. The goal and the purpose of following Jesus. It's right there in front of us. Are we going to follow the things God has for us or not? Your actions speak louder than your words. I, um, many, many of us, we did, we did this. We uh, shoveled snow. If you've got kids, you convinced your kids to do it. 
Yeah, that, that went well. I walked inside. I was like, all right, guys, uh, bundle up. We're going to shovel snow. The amount of joy and excitement startled me. They were like, let's go. You, me, shovels? Let, like, I'm in. They were in it. Five minutes later, you know, why is it that kids can get into snow clothes faster than get into clothes? <laughs> you ask your kids to get in snow clothes like that. You ask them to get ready for soccer practice, they're like, I don't know where my shorts are. The shorts drawer. Didn't look there. I looked everywhere. Can't find. And so here they come out, and there's this level of excitement. There's a joy about it. There's this optimism. So, Father, what do I do? I teach them in the ways of the shoveling. I begin to teach the three of them. I got my three little minions, and, and, and I'm, I'm teaching them how, what I want them to do. So then they turn around, and they start doing it. This is, this is I, I feel like this is a picture of the way God's viewing us. Like, like here he told me what to do. And so I start teaching them what to do. And then they start doing it. And they're like, they may have been whistling and humming. They were on one. They were so excited. Dad's got, you know, two, 90s rock going on in the garage while I'm breaking down Christmas boxes. Like we are like, oh, my word, like Santa Claus, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa came to our house. And all of a sudden I'm breaking down all of the cardboard box. I got to take all these cardboard boxes out in two trips. There's so much. So here, like I'm doing this, and then and then I turn around and, and there's like some bickering going on. Anybody else? There's some bickering, and I was like, all right, whoa, whoa, come at the por favor. Like like you don't need to do this. Like you're fine. Don't get mad at each other. Next thing I know, we've got Berkeley just laying it laying there. <laughs> Beckham's throwing ice into the road, just big hunks of it, just throwing it, trying to make it into the grate, seeing if he can hit that. And then Boston, you know, leader's lead, is yelling at them. What are you guys doing? What, what, do you, what do you, and so it just went, and then he's coming to me like, hey, look at these fools. I'm working, like, this is what, this is the labor you give me? And I feel like really it's so much of a snapshot into our, our life with the goal that God set for our lives. And that's to fulfill the Great Commission. I think many of us, we meet Jesus, but we don't live out a walk with Jesus. We, we received his salvation, and that was it, and we kind of fumble along. You want to know why people leave the church or deconstruct from it? Because they don't know the goal of it. And so all of a sudden, we're like, we, we, you can only get saved so many times until you're kind of frustrated with your, how many times you got saved. And you, were, and you forgot that there's a goal at the end of Matthew 28, verses 19, or verse 16 through 20. And it's the great commission. It's what to do. And really, if you're not doing this, I mean, can, can we say it? You're, you're at some level failing at a walk with Jesus? You've received a salvation, but you have got no walk. You, you, you've got a praise and a worship going, but, but, but no action, no, no moments. Like, you know, like, like you can only come and worship so many times and not look like the one you're worshiping until you get so frustrated that you get so stale with it that you stop going. That's why we walk away. That's why we don't do it. So if we don't know the goal, if we don't know the point, what are we doing here? Because it's not to make us feel better. It's not to show up and have moments, just raise your hand. Like those are great and those are vital. We're not going to forsake the gathering, but we are forsaking the walk. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples, remember Judas fell. They haven't added a new one yet. And they went to Galilee to the mount where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Isn't that good? It's okay to doubt, guys. The, like, like, think about how pinnacle this moment is. He's just died. He's just risen from the dead. He's walking with his disciples. They're worshiping him. Literally, he's there. And it says some still, what? Doubted. You know, sometimes I feel like we, we find ourselves doubting God, so we find ourselves distant from God, but I wonder if your doubting God can bring you closer to God. See, we doubt so often on, uh, to friends about God, but I wonder how often our doubt in God is actually a conversation with God. We give Doubting Thomas such, such a bad name when really he's just doing what we've all done. Is he real? This kind of crazy when really doubting Thomas, what a bad name he gets, ends up being a martyr to southern India, which is known as the end of the known universe. He literally fulfilled the Great Commission. He went to the end of the earth and died a martyr for Jesus. So I wonder if we gave him a better name than doubting Thomas than like fulfilled the Great Commission, Thomas. 
And we find ourselves just so stuck and frustrated with this doubt idea when the people walking with Jesus physically in this moment doubted. It's okay to doubt, but what are you doubting in? Are you doubting in the church? Are you doubting God? Because I can doubt the church pretty often. But, but my God is faithful. My God is true. See, we find ourselves so stuck and frustrated with humanity when humanity is always going to fail you, yet you're so surprised by it. It's like, it's almost comical, but then we hold such offense. I actually originally wrote a, wrote a message all about offense, but I felt like I was too bitter, so I didn't do it. Um, that's just real. Uh, then Jesus came to them. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So because of this authority, he gives us authority. I want you to know God's a giver. Not only did he give his life, but he gives authority. He says, therefore, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God's with us. God gives us authority in this moment. I, I, I read an article um, over Christmas break from the uh, Barna Group, which is a, a, a survey, Christian survey group. It's a study organization. They partner with other organizations um, to study. And, and, and I, I found it interesting that the headline of this article that caught my attention uh, was 51% of churchgoers don't know what the Great Commission is. Don't raise your hands. 51% of churchgoers don't know what the Great Commission is. The Great Commission is what we just read. The Great Commission is the goal of following Jesus. The Great Commission is the point of this thing. See, so often we, 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 make, we, we make our relationship with God just about us. That's why we stop at salvation and we don't move on to the Great Commission. It was all about you not going to hell instead of the world experiencing the glory and the presence of God. As we stop in that moment, we stop in that phrase, 51% of churchgoers surveyed, they didn't know what the Great Commission was. 6% said not sure. 17% said yes, and it means they were able to tell you. 25% yes, but they couldn't recall the exact meaning. I want you to know that there's a great travesty in the church, and that's called biblical illiteracy. That we, that, that we hold on to the Bible, and we have it as an app on our phone, and maybe as a book on our nightstand, but we don't know the Word of God. And so we wonder again why we deconstruct, why we walk away from God is because we don't know the word of God, so we don't know the voice of God, so we don't have a relationship with God. We just have his salvation. And I want to devalue and say just have his salvation. We have the absolute salvation. That's praise God. And like if you're saved and that's the relationship you're walking out, like, like you, you'll make your way, and, and they'll, but, but there will be a day of judgment. And if you don't know the things to do out in that walk with God, you will be judged by God. But only God can judge me. It's a great tattoo. It's a really difficult thing to have a moment in heaven with God. Probably not actually a good tattoo. See, I, I see, a, I see a lot of Christians following Jesus with the goal of becoming a better person, not becoming a disciple. That, that's just self-help stuff. You you can just find yourself like 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 stay up late enough, and, and you'll find self-help stuff. You you can find uh, as much as much as we really want. You can believe in it. Set your goals all about it. I, I'm I'm big big fan of goals. I I want you to have audacious goals. And all, but I want also like set a goal worth setting. I see a lot of Christians, someone told me to say it again, so I will. I see a lot of Christians following Jesus with the goal of becoming a better person. God doesn't make you a better person. He makes you a new person. Not being, we find ourselves not being a disciple. Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it this way. Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. Christianity without discipleship is just Christianity without Christ. That, that, that's performance, that, that's, just, that's just trying, but that's missing out on the main, the, the, the main person in the story. If you hear Christmas Eve, no matter how you uh, put your nativity scene together, Jesus is always at the center. But he's at the center of your life, the center of what you're doing. See, see d discipleship is the distinguishing, dif uh, distinguishing difference between the world and Christianity. It's discipleship. It's, it, it's, it's set apart life. It's we act different, we move different, we see hopes in different. So the goal of 2022, you know what it is? Make disciples. So the goal, it's a goal we're setting. Make disciples. Make disciples. Make disciples. Who is a disciple? A disciple is someone who believes in his doctrine, but believes in the word of God. Number two, rests on his sacrifice. Know that Jesus died for us. Number three, embodies his spirit. I want you to know when you get saved, there's a moment where you raise your hand, you confess your, your love and, and, and care, and you accept Jesus into your heart. When you have that moment, you, you're, you get filled with the Holy Spirit, and that moment that, that you get to live out the Holy Spirit or you get to ignore the Holy Spirit inside of you. 
It's called conviction. It's called, it, it, it's called um, discernment. It's the, he has got gifts for us. And so do you embody that spirit? The third one is it imitates his example. Or fourth one, imitates his example. A disciple is someone who believes in the doctrine of Jesus. We don't move the plumb line of God. And I, you, 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 people and humanity in the world can tell you what to believe, but the word of God confirms what I believe. Rest on his sacrifice. Jesus died for us. There's no getting around that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. He was born as a baby through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lived for 33 years, three of them in the miraculous way of performing miracles. 33rd year, he died on a cross for our sins. Third day, he rose from the grave, defeated death. We, 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 we rest on his sacrifice. Don't, 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 don't negate that, 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 that truth, that miracle that happened. See, Jesus dying on a cross is a, is, is a human moment. Jesus coming out of the grave is a miraculous moment. See, if he just dies on a cross, it's just, it's just a, a moment. But he, when he comes out of that grave, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that's performed. Embodies his spirit. May we disciples, may we embody the, embody the spirit. That means move in the spirit of God. May, may, you, may you move in the fruits of the spirit. May you move in the, the hope for humanity. Number four, it imitates his example. Tim Keller puts it this way. Discipleship is not an option. Jesus says that if anyone would come after me, he must follow me. So it's, it's, not, it's not optional. So really, it's kind of inappropriate to even call it a goal when it's always been the goal, but we've been choosing it as an option whether it's our goal or not. It was, ne- it, was ne- it was never an option, but we've made it an option. Man, I, 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 I was worshiping here, and I, 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 just, I, I just saw like I, I just saw a grace on this house, on a grace on this church for this year, a grace in, in discipleship. Like like I, 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 I want to be discipleship uh, driven and um, and discipleship focused and presence driven. I want us to be so focused on discipleship. I want to be so focused on the presence of God that we would go, that we would make, that we would baptize, and that we would teach. There's four directives in this moment. There's four directives. Go, make, baptize, teach. Go, make, baptize, teach. The reason why this isn't your goal is because you didn't know it was supposed to be. Statistically speaking, the reason why you didn't know that this was the goal of 2022 is because you didn't know that it was supposed to be the goal of 2022. So I think there's three ways that we can start doing this and we, we can put, put this to action. Um, I wrote this uh, while I was in line at the grocery store. Um, it was a really long line. And so I began to uh, write, write this. The first one is, is this. If you want to be a disciple, you got to start with yourself. Oh, you got to start with yourself. There ain't there, there, nobody sitting here like, oh, I just can't wait to disciple somebody. There, no, there, you know, you know that there, there just is not happening. I, I think so often in your career, your sports career, your um, your, your business career, uh, you, you can find mentors or, or or you can make mentors. I got mentors that they don't know my they're my mentor, but they get a gift card from me every once in a while because I call them and ask them hard questions. And, and, and I think so often we're waiting for someone to mentor, to disciple us, to train us in the ways of the Lord when the Bible already has all the answers to train you in the ways of the Lord. And all you got to do is pick it up and start walking that out. No one's sitting at home. Said, hey, I love that the first directive says, therefore, go. Therefore, go. Therefore, j- j- just get up. I mean, that's the thing about like dieting. Like no one asked you whether the food tasted good. They just asked you whether you wanted to co- accomplish the goal. Somehow we made it like, it's just, I don't like it. I don't like vegetables. No one asked you what you like. You set a goal to lose weight. So why don't you just like eat the vegetables and be quiet? Sorry, that's just me. I was in Safeway and I was just writing notes. Dallas Willard puts it this way. Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. If he were you, he'd, he'd, he'd learn the word of God. You know what he did when he lived? He learned the word of God. If he were you, he'd learn how to pray. You know what he did when he lived? He prayed. If he were you, he would tithe. Well, he didn't have a, uh, an income, but I bet you he did tithe. I mean, like, like if he were you, these are the things that he would do. He would Sabbath. We see this all the time. If he were you, he would get in community. He had 12 disciples. Like if he were you, he would do the things that were laid out all throughout scripture. So what are you going to do? Because it starts with you. We love blaming. We're such blame shifters. Oh, I got to leave this. Oh, I got to do this. Oh, they didn't offer the thing I like. Oh, and we begin to move along. No, no, no. If you want to begin to be discipled, you got to start discipling yourself. And that means picking up the Bible, picking up the word of God. Here's a great thing to do. Yesterday was the first. You could have started yesterday, but you know what you can do because you missed yesterday? You can start 
today. You can pick that thing up. You can open the Bible app. It's brilliant. It has so many different plans. All you have to do, pick one. Whoop. You can read it for three days. You can read it for seven days. You can read it for 365 days. You can do whatever you want. There's so many options. You're walking through anxiety. You're walking through love. You're walking through lust. You're walking how to manage your finances. You can find a reading plan that will walk you through all of those things and it'll teach you. All you have to do is you got to do it. You just got to do it. It just, it, it, I mean, like, oh, the vegetable doesn't taste good. No one asks you whether it tastes good or not. You just got to do it. And you have this moment, it starts with you. The most important conversation of every day is your prayer life. It's not your conversation with friends about what you should be praying about. It's just about your prayer. It's just your conversation with God. Lament to him, celebrate with him, cry to him, celebrate him, have a conversation with him. It is so much better than having a conversation with someone else. Start there. And then move on to other places. So how to disciple yourself, read, the, read his word daily, start, start, start a reading plan. Set a goal for one day, set a goal for 365 days, set a goal for seven days. I just walked through the book of, book of Exodus over the finish of the year. I don't know why I picked that, but I did. First half of the book's phenomenal. Second half's like, oh my gosh, cubits, really again? Uh, talk to him daily. Pick a, if any Exodus people are like, yep. Um, um, uh, talk to him daily. Have a prayer life. Have a prayer. Set an alarm. People are like, I forget all the time. Set an alarm. Do you remember? Because it'll alarm you. And the third one is probably one of the most important ones that we miss out on regularly. It's tithe to his church. See, when you manage your finances biblically, you'll watch your burdens of your money lift daily. When, 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 you, when you manage your finances biblically, you'll watch the burdens of your finances be lifted daily. My, my, my friend just just told me about this crazy job promotion he got and his back pay and all this wild stuff. And after we got done texting pleasantries of just excitement and joy and hard work and his tears that he couldn't believe that this happened, I just, I just wrote back, God's real bad at math. It's amazing how he asks us, and, 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 he, and, he, and he leads us to tithe 10%, yet always leaves us with more than enough. Always, always leaves him more than enough. He's, he's the priority of his focus, and, and financial bur- if finances are burdens in your life, I, 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 would, I would ask you, first thing I would ask you is whether tithing is a part of your life. If tithing is a part of your life, I'll, I'll, you'll watch the financial burdens of your life. It doesn't mean your finances will change, but it means that every, the burdens of your finances will change. Yeah, everything would just be begin to make sense all, all of a sudden. If you don't, if you don't know that, well, open up the Bible app. Um, l- look at a, a plan on uh, good plans and look at uh, plans on finances, and it'll just reiterate exactly what I, I just said. The, the, the fourth thing, this is just a couple of lists. Remember, I'm in line at Safeway. It's Sabbath. We see Jesus Sabbath all the time. All, all the time, yet, yet we, we, we remove Sabbath from our, from our rhythms. Sabbath is a day that you don't die to the world. Sabbath is a day that you don't produce in your job. Make yourself overtly present with your family, overtly present um, with with, with a hobby that you might have. Um, The guys in the room are like, all right, so I get to golf on my Sabbath. You do, you do, if you have the blessings of your spouse. All women said amen. Amen and amen, amen. Sorry, this is for God, Kara. I just, God told me I needed to golf. If you want to have a conversation with him, he's right there. I'll be gone for the next five to six hours. <laughs> I think one of the other most important ones, just by far, is community. Community, community, community. Too, too much of this world um, lives and celebrates and mourns life in isolation. And misses out on community. Here, here in uh, February, view groups start up and if you're looking to lead a group, you're looking to be a part of it, signups will, will, will happen here shortly, but if you're looking to uh, uh, lead a group, lead a group you're, you're actually like the person in the room who was like, I do want to disciple people. Um, like like you, can, you can do that. You can fill out a connect card and, 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 and fill out when it comes to the, the view group part, go and check that box. And um, our team, Jonathan specifically, will reach back out to you and, and help, help you sign up for that, be a leader group. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than community that celebrates and mourns life with you. 
picks you up, peels, you know, we, we just had, you know, a, a handful of babies born in the church. And like, it, they, like as we were as we were at their house, just celebrating the birth of this little baby, they're like, they, they were, they, they're enthralled with their new child, but they were amazed by community that cleaned their house, that stocked their uh, um, uh, fridge with groceries, like that's what community does. And so often we miss out, we, 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 we feel jealous in those stories because we miss out on those stories because we're over here in isolation. Luke chapter 14, verse 27, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That imagery is just, it's kind of dark and difficult, but it's just so incredibly true. Billy Graham puts it this way of discipleship. To be a disciple is to be committed to Jesus Christ as as Savior and Lord and committed to following him every day. To be a disciple is to be disciple, uh, to be disciplined in our bodies, minds, and souls. See, when you invest in yourself, I think one of the most important things is when you invest in yourself, you make your immediate circle better. When you invest in yourself physically or, or you get to counseling mentally, or spiritually, you don't make people around you worse, you make them better. So the second part of, uh, of, of discipleship, first you got to start with yourself. The second one, you, you got to move to your house. You, gotta, you, you, just, you just always got you always got to move to your house. Uh, A.W. Tozer puts it this way: only a disciple can make a disciple. Hey. So we wonder why, so often, um, you know, families. Um, we wonder why so often our marriages, our finances. I mean, and I think we can specifically just speak out to men. You know, generals get so confused in our society right now, but they're pretty clear in the Bible. Um, the man's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the household. That's, that's tried and true. And, um, and I think so often we have spiritually weak men, so we have spiritually weak homes. And so men, we've got a, there's a time to rise and a time to get called up and a time to, you know, women are strong too. Have you met Kara? Like we're like equally as strong. And sometimes I'm like, I gotta, you know, but like, like we are, you, you spoke spiritually weak men lead spiritually weak homes because they never disciple themselves. They'll never disciple their children. They'll never disciple the, their wife. They'll, they'll never co-labor with their spouse. They'll just uh, labor and toil. They'll just work at, uh, hard and really against each other so often. See, m m most likely you're not making any disciples because you're not a disciple yourself. You're saved, but you never worked on the rest of it. You don't pick up your Bible. You don't listen to worship music. You don't pray regularly. The things that worry you lead to more worry, not to more presence of God. So your worry should lead to the presence, not 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 more rocking chair. Wor 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 worry should lead you to your knees. Wor 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 worry should lead you to worship. Wor wor worry should lead you to your pastor. It's, it's, it's got to lead you to a place, but so often our worry leads us to isolation opposed to the presence of God. While he was with us the entire time, and I think we, we do that with our parenting. We do it with our marriages all the time. This is our parenting. We oftentimes wait, wait for the church to, uh, to uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. The, the, the church will point your kids to Jesus, but you'll train your ways, and you'll train your kids in the ways of the Lord. The, 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 the Bible doesn't mince words there. But the Bible doesn't say the church will train your kids in the ways of the Lord. Yeah, it'll always point your kids to Jesus, and it'll, it'll always train them. Like, like that, that's what that's what we do here. But, but, but there's an ownership and an onus on fathers and on mothers and on grandparents to train their children in the ways of the Lord. That doesn't guarantee their walk with the Lord, but it guarantees a foundation of a training in the ways of the Lord. They might fall distant, but that prodigal comes home. So, I, you know, parenting, pa parents who've trained their kids in the ways of the Lord have walked a child, wa watched a child walk off to a pig pen. But come on, can in 2022 you get on your knees and pray for them to return home by the prodigal? Just begin to rejoice in their name right now. That praise God that they're coming home this year. Praise God that child, I trained this kid. I trained this kid. If you got young kids, begin to train your kids in the ways of the Lord. If you got older kids, begin to speak into their lives. See, we don't need we don't need to just be present fathers and present mothers. We, we need to be intentional mothers and intentional fathers. Intentional around the kids' table. Uh, uh, my kids on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they get to watch cartoons on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We listen to worship music, and most of the time I read a Bible story and we talk about it. I told a friend that, and he said, oh, my word, or the couple, it was the mom and dad. They said, our kids would never do that. No, 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 kids entered my life. I didn't enter their life. They'll do what I trained them to do. I guide them and I raise them. And they say, yeah, you can tell no to me, and then we can have a talk with, you know, boop, 
and a uh, little, little conversation with, with, with love, and they'll, they'll, they'll walk their way right back. I mean, so often, uh, parenting is one of the most difficult, t- no, parenting is the most difficult thing you'll ever do, um, and I'm waiting for the reward. They're called grandchildren, amen, and um, but I got years until then, so I'm going to train them up in the ways of the Lord until we get there. Fathers, let's set up. Your home is, is built to be led spiritually, and it's being led um, by someone. I hope it's you. Your home's being led spiritually. I just wonder if you're the voice spiritually speaking into your home. I, I tell people about that morning routine. They always tell me, oh, our kids wouldn't do that. I, I, Karen always uses this line. Uh, kids entered our life. We didn't enter their lives. They were born into our family. I wasn't born into their family. We became family, but we're the leaders of the family. Your spouse, Karen and I, we, we ask this question. We, we, we always want to ask it more. We're not good at reading our Bibles together. We, we read our Bibles differently. She does it in silence like a monk, and I do it like a rock star. Like I got like worship music, and I'm like like down with the system, and she's like, oh. it's actually like complete silence for her. She's like, uh, excuse me, while I was reading Proverbs, I noticed you breathed. Um, I've now missed the rest of my Bible time. Sorry for existing. <laughs> We, we just learned, like, this doesn't work for us. People are like, you guys must read your Bibles together all the time. I'm like, uh, no, never. Uh, we go to a coffee shop, and I'm like, zen, because there's just chaos going on. She's like, uh, misery, because chaos is going on. But, you, but, but we ask ourselves, we ask each other this question, what's the Lord teaching you? You want to have a good conversation with your spouse? That TV ain't getting put on for the rest of the night. What's the Lord teaching you? Could be a quick response. Could be a short response. Could be a really long response. Could lead to a fight. Um, could lead to a lot of things. But fights lead to other stuff. So you'll be fine. Um, I, told, I was in line. Literally, I'm in line at Safeway writing this. Um, I'm, going, I'm going long. Um, your, uh, the, your, your kids, your spouse, your home. Uh, and you, know, you know what that payoff is, though? The payoff will be the day, I'll, I'll cry, I'll do it. The payoff will be the day that I get to baptize my kids, though. Payoff will be the day. You know, I got to baptize Kara. She'd never been baptized before. So, I don't know, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. Handful of years ago. Um, I got to baptize her. You know, because it, it leads so clearly, go, make disciples, baptize them teaching and baptism and and if you've never been baptized february 2nd we're going to midweek service and we're going to baptize people at that midweek service and we're going to anoint um, um leaders with oil and we're going to worship that night it's going to be beautiful um you've never been baptized it's time to be baptized and the person who brought you to church or walked you to church ask them to baptize you that might be me and pe- people are, i want the pastor to do it and that's great like uh, it's such an honor but I, I think I think someone who's walked with you intimately in that process um, would be feel even more honored to baptize you in that moment. Uh, they're the ones that have pain um, to pray for you. So it starts with your home, or start, starts with you. Invest in your home. Third one, uh, look look for others. Always look for others. It's difficult to look for others when you haven't discipled yourself. And this is this is the goal. This is it. Like, what, what's the goal? You, it's like lose fifteen pounds, disciple. Like, no, this is it. When you when you start looking for others, your, your life changes. You know, it's why we offer view culture in the twenty third. Don't quote me. I think it's in twenty third, um, the fourth Sunday of the month, Be, because one of the greatest gifts that we could ever give you as a church is for you to discover your purpose. You discover like why you were born what you do, what you're good at. You know, healthy people have hope for their friends and their family and coworkers. Healthy people, people who are discipling themselves, people who are walking, people who learn how to train their ways, kids, their spouse and their family, the ways of the Lord. I call it an eyes up mentality, eyes up followers of Jesus. See, when you tithe, your eyes lift. When you're stingy and, and, and you're worried about your finances all the time, your eyes, they, they inevitably look down. They, they Boom, right down. See, when you read your Bible, your eyes lift. Your eyes lift. I, 
couldn't believe how much the Lord spoke to me in the book of Exodus last month. I don't know why. I don't know why the Lord led, led me to it. Then I read it every day, finished on the 27th. And I was like, that's why. I was just blown away. You know the word that I really got? Probably more than anything. Who's my Aaron and who's my Ur? Who's holding my arms? Who, who's holding it? This Moses story. I just began to dive into Moses and more Moses and more Moses. Blown away. Who is that man? See, when you read your Bible, your eyes lift. But when you read Facebook, when you read uh, uh, your, your anxiety, when you read your stress, your head shifts down. The Bible always lifts you up. When you pray, your eyes lift. The world changes. Mark Dever, great study um, kind of guy church culture wrote this. He says, uh, the Christian life is the discipled life and the discipling life. It's the discipled life and the discipling life. What's the goal of 2022? Become a disciple. I, I, I can go a lot longer about this. Why, why I think so many people and they, they say the local church is in, in decline in America and all those kind of statistics. I always look at the answer being right there in scripture. Disciples. Uh, butts and seats might be leaving the church, but disciples stay. Disciples have a foundation. Disciples stand the test of time. Disciples have discipline. Everything worthwhile is uphill. Everything worthwhile is uphill. Jesus woke up early. Come on, we'll wake up early. Jesus got Jesus got away to Sabbath time. I'm gonna get away on Sabbath time. Jesus prayed for others. You know, Jesus was asked 137 questions throughout the Gospels. You know, he answered three of those directly. So Jesus. You know, in those conversations, he asked 305 questions. I think that's what a disciple does. Slow to speak. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Quick to listen. Come on, let me stand to my feet. It's just as we close the first service of 2022. First service. First 10 a.m. We'll talk more about the direction, some things we're going to do. The first one is what's your goal for this year? And I hope that one day into it, we changed it. One day into it, you're still going to lose 15 pounds. Not that you need it. Or how about this? You're still going to be happy with the body that you've created over this last winter. Amen. <laughs> with a desire to become a disciple of Jesus. With a goal of becoming a disciple of Jesus with a goal of discipling your home. You could be single. Don't, don't, don't miss that point. You're single. You, you set the spiritual tone in your home. You, you set its generosity. You set its worship. You, 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 set the, you, you, you set that. You create that. So that when family, come on, praise God, when family enters into it, they enter into a culture that's already led by the Spirit of God. That's already led by worship. That's already led by waking up in the morning, reading the Bible. That's already read by Sabbath, led by Sabbath. That's already read. Come on, don't, don't singles, don't, don't, don't miss out on this opportunity. And then you pick your eyes up and you look for others. See, friends want their other friends to participate in the local church. Disciples want their friends to walk out a relationship with God. And it's beautiful to bring someone to church. Be absolutely beautiful. It's life-changing to sit down and teach someone how to read the Bible. But until you learn how to read the Bible, you'll never teach someone how to read the Bible. Until you pray, you'll never teach someone how to pray. Until, until come on, this is the year that we come from gatherers to disciples. Let's close our eyes. Father, we thank you for this first service. We thank you for your download your prophetic word that you wrote over 2,000 years ago through your son 
speaking to his 11 disciples, saying, all right, guys, this is what to do. You got the spirit on you. You got the spirit in you. You got the authority. Let's go. I'm going to have you go. I'm going to have you make. I'm going to have you baptize. And I'm going to have you teach. Come on, God, do a work in us. Come on, this, these are your people. These are your children. Desperate to become disciples. Tired of just being gatherers. May you lead us. In Jesus' name. Darkness.